There's recently been a good deal of controversy in the UK surrounding some judgments of the European Court of Human Rights. Successive governments in the UK since 1989, when the court decided a case called Suring against the United Kingdom, have considered that the court's interpretation of several of the rights under the Convention um, have uh, interfered unduly with the formulation of public policy within the state. Um, as is well known, there have been some high-profile examples, disagreement, for example, as to whether it's permissible to maintain the UK's blanket ban on um, prisoners who have been convicted of offences voting in elections. An even longer-running source of tension stems from the decision of the court in 1996 in Chahal against the United Kingdom that the obligation of states not to subject people to torture and inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment um, or indeed violations of at least some other rights under the European Convention makes it unlawful for the state to extradite or to deport people to places where there's a real risk that these rights will be violated. Uh, ministers in this country often consider that this unduly interferes with the right of states to control the freedom of foreign nationals to enter and remain on UK territory, uh, particularly in the context of people who are suspected of, of being a threat to the public interest, public safety, national security. Um, successive governments have campaigned through diplomatic action and also by intervening in litigation in the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg when similar issues have arisen in, arisen in relation to other states um, in order to water down, if possible, people's right not to be sent to places where they face torture. Uh, the case of Abu Qatada or Othman is a good example of the implications of this. Othman or Abu Qatada, I shall call him Abu Qatada, which is the name by which he's best known, came to this country in 1993 from Jordan, where he had been born. Um, he was granted asylum as a refugee. This was mainly on the uh, ground that he had been detained and tortured by Jordanian security forces in Jordan twice in 1988 and in 1990-91. to after he arrived here in 1999, Jordan's State Security Court convicted him in his absence of encouraging a conspiracy to bomb the American school and the Jerusalem Hotel in Amman in 1998. The main ex uh, evidence against him was a confession by another defendant who claimed that he had been tortured to extract that confession. The claim that he had been tortured was supported by medical examiners and by his lawyers. But the uh, Jordanian court decided that he hadn't proved torture and admitted his confession as evidence not only against him but also against uh, Abu Qatada. In the autumn of 2000, Abu Qatada was again tried in his absence in Jordan on a charge of encouraging another conspiracy to cause explosions. Uh, this time he was alleged to have paid for a computer and his published writings, which had been found at the house of a, a, a co-defendant, were said to have encouraged the conspiracy. The main evidence against him once again came from the confession of a co-defendant, um, who again claimed that the uh, confession had been extracted by torture. Yet again, the Jordanian court didn't really investigate the allegation of torture. In 2000, after all this, Jordan started an application to extradite Abu Qatada from the UK, but in due course uh, dropped the application. In the meantime, Abu Qatada, uh, still in the UK, had applied for indefinite leave to remain. While his application was being considered, the attacks on the USA by Al-Qaeda occurred in September 2001. Um, following that, in 2002, Abu Qatada was detained in this country under powers uh, granted by the Anti-Terrorism Crime and Security Act 
2001. The uh, reason for his detention was that he was suspected of being linked to Al-Qaeda. Uh, at this point, having detained him, the UK government started to consider the possibility of deporting him to, um, uh, to Jordan. And uh, the Foreign and Commonwealth Office advised that this would contravene uh, his right to be free of torture. The UK government then, uh, as a result, started to negotiate with Jordan, seeking a memorandum of understanding that um, people deported to Jordan from the UK uh, would not face the risk of torture. This would have allowed the UK to deport Abu Qatada and others in a similar position. Um, a memorandum of understanding was finally agreed in 2005. But in the meantime, in December 2004, the House of Lords um, had held that the detention powers under which Abu Qatada was being held violated the detainees' rights to liberty and freedom from discrimination on the ground of nationality. Parliament, therefore, um, replaced the uh, 2001 provisions with the Prevention of Terrorism Act 2005, introducing a new regime of restricted freedom through control orders rather than detention. Um, Abu Qatada was freed but subjected to a control order and appealed against the order. While his appeal was pending in 2005, immediately after having uh, agreed the Memorandum of Understanding with Jordan, the Home Office told him that it intended to deport him to Jordan because his presence here threatened national security. Abu Qatada challenged that decision on various grounds. One of them was a risk that he would be tortured um, and that although he wouldn't he would, he would have to be retried if returned to Jordan. The Jordanian authorities couldn't simply rely on his um, uh, trial in absentia. Um, he would not get a fair hearing because he'd be liable to be convicted on the basis of evidence uh, obtained by torture, whether torture of himself or more likely, given the mem memorandum of understanding, torture of others. Um, the uh, agreement, the Memorandum of Understanding between the UK and Jordan gave assurances that people deported to Jordan wouldn't suffer torture, but no assurance that evidence obtained from torturing other people wouldn't be used against the people deported. So he appealed against the deportation order. Um, it went first to the Special Immigration Appeals Commission the Commission decided that the Memorandum of Understanding uh, would effectively remove the risk of torture of Abu Qatada himself, but wouldn't remove a real risk that evidence obtained by torture could be used um, against Abu Qatada at his retrial in Jordan. The Commission took the view, however, that this wouldn't amount to a flagrant denial of justice, and that was the standard to apply when deciding whether the UK government would be acting unlawfully in uh, returning Abu Qatada to Jordan. Um, Abu Qatada appealed against that decision and the Court of Appeal um, disagreed with the Commission on this point. Uh, but on a further appeal, the House of Lords held that using evidence obtained by torture of others against Abu Qatada wouldn't amount to a fundamental denial of the right to a fair hearing all lead to egregious injustice. Uh, so they said Abu Qatada could legally be deported. Abu Qatada challenged that ruling before the European Court of Human Rights, which held a public hearing on uh, 14th December 2010 before a seven judge chamber. And the difficulty of the case is indicated by the fact that it took over a year before the Chamber gave its judgment on the 17th of January 2012. The Court held unanimously, in a, accordance with its long-standing case law, including Chahal, that it would violate Abu Qatada's right to be free of torture, to deport him to a country where he'd face a real risk of being tortured, 
but that the memorandum of understanding between Jordan and the UK was reliable and removed the risk of Abu Qatar to himself being tortured. On the other hand, uh, in agreement with the uh, Court of Appeal in this country, the court found that the use of evidence obtained by torture was a standard feature of the Jordanian criminal system and that it was likely that Abu Qatada's retrial would involve the use of such evidence. This, thought the Strasbourg court, would be a flagrant denial of his right to a fair hearing. Um, it followed that it would be unlawful for the UK government to deport Abu Qatada to Jordan unless it could first secure reliable assurances from the Jordanian government uh, that no evidence obtained by torture would be used at Abu Qatada's trial. The UK government um, uh, obtained those assurances and was poised to deport Abu Qatada when just within the time limit he lodged with the Strasbourg court a request for his case to be referred to the Grand Chamber of the Court. Um, this led to a, an outbreak of political uh, posturing uh, in which the blame for this further delay was put on the court. Um, it actually was a standard issue of the uh, convention. Abu Qatada's deportation was then stayed until the 9th of May 2012, when a panel of judges of the European Court of Human Rights um, re rejected his request for a referral to the Grand Chamber. Uh, the judgment of 17th of January then became final and cleared the way for a final decision in this country um, to deport him. Now, what is the significance of Abu Qatada's case for the relationship between the UK and Strasbourg? Four matters seem to me to stand out. First of all, the judgment of the court as a key international tribunal reinforces an international consensus that torture is unacceptable and that states which employ it can't expect other states to cooperate with them. This is particularly significant in relation to cooperation on criminal justice matters. The judgment reflected the European consensus by holding for the first time that international disapproval of torture had reached a point where it should always be regarded as a flagrant violation of the right to a fair hearing to send someone to face a trial involving the use of evidence obtained by torture. Um, and that it would be as unlawful to send a person to face such a trial as it would be to send the same person to uh, face torture himself or herself. The idea that a trial in a member state of the Council of Europe would violate the right to a fair hearing if the court were to make use of evidence obtained by torture isn't new. Uh, it's been well established for some time. For example, uh, this was decided by the court in a case called Gefgen against Germany in 2010. What's new is the decision that deporting someone to face such a hearing in a state which is not a party to the convention would itself violate his or her right to a fair hearing under the convention. This may represent uh, something of an international backlash against American attempts since 9-11 to make torture an acceptable part of anti-terrorism strategy, uh, both by uh, trying to redefine torture to allow treatment which shocks the conscience, and also by encouraging states to participate in torture through mechanisms such as the so-called extraordinary rendition. The second uh, implication, I think, is that the case demonstrates how the effect of the court's firm line on torture need not necessarily interfere with the policy-making process within states, um, especially in relation to immigration or security policies relating to foreign nationals. The decision requires deporting states to make secure arrangements with receiving states to ensure that deportees will be treated with the respect to which they would be entitled had they remained within the Council of Europe's geographical area. 
appropriately reliable memoranda of understanding with other states are capable of ensuring that the UK can give effect to its foreign and security policies while respecting fundamental rights and freedoms. Nevertheless, the case highlights the current delicacy of relations between the UK government and the European Court of Human Rights. The government has used its presidency of the Council of Europe to press for amendments to the Convention to limit the power of the court to review rules, acts, decisions made by national authorities within states, at least where the application of the Convention has been properly considered by authorities within the state. On 19th and 20th April 2012, a high-level conference on the future of the European Court of Human Rights met in Brighton. This was the third of a series of such conferences. It concluded with a declaration which mentioned the importance of subsidiarity, allowing um, decisions to be taken at the lowest level uh, possible, uh, where people are most likely to understand the implications of those decisions, and also the importance of state sovereignty. The Declaration reaffirmed the wholly orthodox position that, and I quote, states parties must respect the rights and freedoms guaranteed by the Convention and must effectively resolve violations at the national level. Uh, the Court acts as a safeguard for violations that have not been remedied at the national level, where the Court finds a violation states' parties must abide by the final judgment of the court. That's the end of that quotation. But the Declaration also stresses the margin of appreciation or discretion which states have in the way they apply and implement the Convention. And again, I quote, concludes that for reasons of transparency and accessibility, a reference to the principle of subsidiarity and the doctrine of the margin of appreciation, as developed in the court's case law, should be included in the preamble to the Convention, and invites the Committee of Ministers, that is of the Council of Europe, uh, to adopt the necessary amending instrument by the end of 2013, while recalling the state's party's commitment to give full effect to their obligation to secure the rights and freedoms defined in the Convention. That's the end of that quote. The third implication of interest, particularly for those who feel that the Strasbourg Court adopts a different and perhaps less practical approach to rights from that adopted by English courts, uh, the Abu Qatada case usefully in illustrates that the Strasbourg Court's approach is not alien to that of our judges. The uh, European Court of Human Rights in that case adopted the facts and much of the legal uh, assessment common to the judgments of the Special Immigration Appeal Commission, the Court of Appeal and the House of Lords in this country. On the key issue of impact of torture on the fairness of a hearing, they preferred the approach of our Court of Appeal to that of the House of Lords. But there was nothing in the judgment of the Strasbourg Court that couldn't be found mirrored in the judgments of our domestic courts. Finally, uh, the case shows how important it is for human rights to protect members of unpopular minorities and how valuable it can be to have a judicial rather than purely political process uh, for that purpose. Abu Qatada is suspected of being a spiritual inspiration for Al-Qaeda and of encouraging, if not actively assisting the planning of acts of terrorism. He's feared and hated in many parts of the world. Equally, he's admired and loved in others. But where he's feared and hated, it makes it less likely that any case against him will be evaluated carefully and dispassionately. Yet it's in just such circumstances that careful and dispassionate evaluation of evidence is most needed. The dangers of injustice and unjustified harm to individuals arise most when we dispense with due process and procedural humanity. This is exemplified by the 
uh, history of sanctions imposed on individuals since 9-11 uh, by UN Security Council resolutions. Originally these targeted the people subject to them without any procedure for them to put their cases before or after the resolutions were made. More recently the procedure has been improved somewhat but it led to considerable injustice in a good many cases. As the President of the European Court of Human Rights, Sir Nicholas Bratzer, said in his speech at the Brighton Conference in April 2012, I quote, It is in the nature of the protection of fundamental rights and the rule of law that sometimes minority interests have to be secured against the view of the majority. End of the quote. He reminded governments that the court's judgments have brought real benefits for countries on the internal plane and anyone in this country would be able to see how the UK has benefited over the years. The Abu Qatada case shows that this is a role which judges can and do perform sensitively and in a balanced way, both domestically and internationally.